Ave Maria Purissima, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Again, as usual, throughout the, the mission, I've edited and cut and spliced quotes. And again, I will occasionally cite some sources, but since I've quoted from so many, it'd be tedious to, to read them off from the pulpit. The last night was kind of a marathon. We had to establish three things. First, that there is an explanation for the mysterious vision uh, released by the Vatican. Remember that the released text is a description of the vision the three children saw, all three of them. But there are no words from Our Lady. Our Lady told the girls they were not supposed to tell this to anybody, but they could tell it to Francisco. Because as we remember, Francisco always saw Our Lady, but never heard a single word she said. So Our Lady told the girls they were not supposed to tell this to anybody, but they could tell it to Francisco. So what were the girls supposed to tell Francisco? He saw everything they saw. So we went through it in some detail. There's an explanation for the vision. Second, we considered various clues and testimonies as to the probable contents of that explanation. We quickly considered uh, the meaning and symbolism of the miracle of the sun in itself again. We briefly considered some of the symbolism in the vision itself. And we considered some of the testimonies of various reliable witnesses who have either read the third secret themselves or received information from Sister Lucia or the Pope by which they may have been able to infer its contents. And we considered several approved apparitions which uh, seemed to shed light on certain aspects of the vision. So we weighed the various clues and testimonies as to the probable contents of the explanation. Uh, Then uh, the the third thing we established last night was by considering the statements of the various popes during their visits to Fatima, we see common themes which are consistent with what we would expect to find an explanation of the vision. And so if we consider uh, publishing the vision as an explicit uh, revealing of the symbolic part of the third secret and the Pope's remarks as an implicit revealing of the explanatory part of the third secret, then we can see that the Vatican is telling the truth when it states the whole third secret has been revealed. One way very openly in, in the sense that they published and you, they, there's photostats on the Vatican website of the vision The other way, implicitly, by the same consistent themes, starting with Paul VI and his visit in 1967, and a number of visits of of St. John Paul II, where they're the exact same themes, and they're citing the same lines from the Apocalypse. And in fact, it gets more and more detailed as they go on. Okay, so tonight we're going to attempt to bring all this together with a probable explanation for the vision. At the same time... Hopefully we'll have a clear idea of just how the Vatican can truly say that everything's been revealed and also get some idea of why they chose to reveal things in the way they have and why it was so hard for Sister Lucia to write it down. We'll follow that with some thoughts as to the importance of this vision for the church, the world, and each one of us here, and then concrete actions we should each take. And then we'll close with a very great grace because the pastor is going to consecrate the parish to the Immaculate Heart, after which I'll go back and hear confessions. It's your last opportunity. I'll be leaving town. I don't recognize your voices, so you can take advantage of that. Okay. Let's start by taking the various clues and testimonies we considered last night to the probable contents of the explanation and try to synthesize them. So as we've seen, witnesses to the miracle of the Son were themselves convinced they were experiencing the end of the world. We also saw that the dancing of the sun was itself an apocalyptic image. St. Alphonsus, summarizing the teaching of the fathers, makes clear, another sign of the end of the world will be, and the powers of heaven shall be moved. Some understand this to mean tremors and unusual movements which will occur in the heavens. That is, the firmness of the heavens will seem to be lacking, as they will tremble before the Lord comes to judge the world. Close quote. We saw that Sister Lucia in a 1957 interview said, quote, Father, the Most Holy Virgin made me understand that we are in the last times of the world. So let's start with that as a working hypothesis. We're in the last times of the world. What should we expect? Giving the limited amount of time will only give a thumbnail sketch of some aspects of those days. At the end of the world, when the fullness of the Gentiles have come into the church, the nations will suddenly turn away from the one true faith and turn back to their pagan gods and goddesses. 
back to the worship of demons from which our ancestors, except for the Hebrews here, Hebrew Catholics, from which our ancestors were free. This massive turning away from the one true faith, this rebellion by Catholics against the one true faith, is known as the great apostasy. The fathers and doctors have explained what this apostasy means. For example, St. Thomas explains that this apostasy will be separation from the faith and separation from obedience to the Pope. Pope St. Leo the Great teaches that indeed the great apostasy will mean abandoning the faith and abandoning obedience to the Pope. St. Augustine adds this event must precede the coming of the Antichrist. And St. Augustine adds that not all will abandon the faith, but few will retain it. Now the Antichrist can't rise up until the great apostasy occurs. And as St. Paul indicates in a very mysterious passage, in 2 Thessalonians, that the great apostasy is being hindered from being broken out by a system or a man. Cardinal Manning, summarizing the teaching of the fathers and scholastic theologians in a fascinating book published in 1861, explains what had thus far kept the great apostasy from totally breaking out. In other words, what this system or man was that was hindering the outbreak. His arguments are fascinating. But in a nutshell, since about the 7th century, because there's been changes since the beginning of the church, and he goes through what the fathers taught, but that doesn't pertain to tonight. Since about the 7th century, the power which hinders this is Christendom, that's the system, and the Pope. So it's the coalition of Catholic states and the Pope. The coalition of Catholic states no longer exists, so it's the Pope. Now, this is really important. Cardinal Manny points out that the Antichrist is directly opposed by the spiritual and temporal authority, the twofold authority, which by divine providence, the Pope has been invested by Christ. So what does that mean? The spiritual authority of the Pope is that by which he rules the church. And the temporal authority of the Pope is that by which he rules the Vatican State. The Pope is not a subject to any state. He's rather a sovereign ruler in his own right. He's a ruler. He's independent. So the power that prevents the manifestation of the Antichrist is both the system, Christendom, that system of the great family of Catholic nations whose whole social order, government, and authority were rooted in the true faith, and a person, the Pope, who exercised this twofold authority, the very authority under whom the whole family of Christian nations were gathered. So the power that prevents the manifestation of the Antichrist is both the system, Christendom, that system of the, the, the great Catholic nations that's gone, it's vanished from the face of the earth now, and a person, the Pope, who exercised a twofold authority, spiritual and temporal. Again, the spiritual authority is that by which he rules the church, the temporal authority is that by which he rules the Vatican State. He's not subject to any state. He's a sovereign rule in his own right. And in fact, there are many distinguished symbols of that twofold papal authority. So hold that thought. Now, last night we considered the apparition of the Virgin of Revelation to Bruno Cornicchiolo in Rome in 1947. Later on, as we saw, she said that 33 years afterwards, this would be confirmed by many signs and manifestations, and regularly, in the 80s at least, uh, on, on the feast day every, every year, there'd be things, the miracle of the sun, medical miracles, and so forth, right there. It's a shrine manned by, by, man by Franciscans in Rome. At one point during this apparition, Our Lady pointed to something laying near her feet. There on the ground was a black cloth which held a smashed crucifix. The black cloth, similar to the torn vestment, and the broken crucifix lying at the feet of Our Lady symbolized clerical vestments and other distinguishing signs that so many consecrated souls were about to discard. Of course, we're all familiar with priests and religious who are guilty of just that, trying to dress and ultimately live as though they had not been set aside for God. What follows next is going to be very painful. In fact, I have to say that I've never uh, had such difficulties in in, uh, preparing a sermon or a conference uh, ever. For at least the last thousand years or so, a red shoulder cape over a white cassock has been the clothing of the Pope. Why? Why? Because it stood for the spiritual, the supremacy of the spiritual sphere of the temporal. And so Pope St. Gregory VII warned that only the Pope may use the red cape as a sign of imperial authority and martyrdom. Putting on the red cope is a highly symbolic act 
that stands for the Pope assuming the full authority of his office. Pope Francis refused to accept the red coat. And that refusal signifies something more than a personal preference. It's a symbolic denial of an aspect of papal authority. Pope Francis, who is actually the sovereign ruler of the Vatican State, made a point of renewing his Argentinian passport after he was elected Pope. So not only is this a symbolic denial of papal authority, in a very real sense, it's also an actual denial of papal authority, an actual submission of the Pope himself to the authority of another nation. He has made himself subject to another state. The red shoes of the Pope symbolize his willingness to lead his flock into martyrdom. He refused to accept the red shoes. Instead of accepting the traditional golden petrol cross, Pope Francis kept an iron cross that he first got in his auxiliary bishop in Buenos Aires. And anyone can do an image search to see what he did with that cross when he met with the chief rabbis of Israel on May 26, 2014. He tucked the cross under his sash. The whole meaning of his office is he's the vicar of Christ, and he hid that. The one thing those men need, the one thing every man needs, is Christ, and he hides that. The symbolism there is terrifying. Perhaps the most astonishing, disturbing act occurred last year, on July 8, 2015, during his visit to Bolivia, when Pope Francis has accepted a monstrous and absolutely diabolical crucifix that was made from a hammer and sickle, which is a communist symbol, with the body of our Lord on it, mounted on it, as if it were a crucifix. He then allowed the president of Bolivia, Eva Morales, to hang a medal around his neck with a similar diabolical crucifix made from a hammer and sickle along with the body of our Lord. The symbolism here of the heirs of Russia being accepted by the Pope himself to the point where he publicly wears such a symbol couldn't be any clearer. This is serious stuff. Remember that the power that prevents the manifestation of the Antichrist is both a system, Christendom, it's vanished, gone, and a person, the Pope, who exercises a twofold authority, spiritual and temporal. The spiritual authority is that by which he rules the church, and the temporal authority is that by which he rules the Vatican State. He's not a subject to any state, but he's a sovereign ruler in his own right. So what are we saying? We are saying that the Pope, who is the authority, the very authority that God has placed in the world to prevent the complete outbreak of the great apostasy, the rising up of the man of sin, the Antichrist, has refused to fully embrace and exercise his authority. In fact, the Pope is using his authority to wreak havoc in the church. Last night we heard that in 1995, Cardinal Chiappi, he was a papal theologian of Pope Pius XII, St. John XXIII, Paul VI, John Paul I, St. John Paul II stated, quote, In the third secret it is foretold, among other things, that the great apostasy in the church begins at the top. Close quote. The great apostasy in the church begins at the top. It's hard to say. Just a few days ago, while giving a talk to confessors, the Pope told them they could absolve penitents who don't actually confess their sins. They can come in there and be mute, and you can absolve them. That's against the Council of Trent, solemnly defined, but I don't, you don't need the priest to point that out. You can't confess your sins if you don't confess your sins. And I want to tell you what. If a priest obeys him, he's committing a sacrilege. What do I have to judge? The priest has to judge things. There's three things in confession the priest judges. Are there sin? Is there contrition? Will they do the penance? The sin is how you judge that. They tell you. Is there contrition? You find out there's contrition. If they, if they say they're having, they, they got a drug problem, you say, do you have any drugs? If they got them in possession, hmm, we got something you got to do first before you confess the sins. If they say they're living with somebody, they got to move out. You see, so are there sins? Is there contrition? Will they do the penance? That's what you judge. And so if you actually absolve somebody who doesn't confess their sins, and I'm not talking somebody dying there where you're conditionally absolving them because they can't talk. Somebody that comes to confession to you and just sits there quietly because that's what the Pope is talking about. You're committing a sacrilege. 
I have to confect a sacrament. If I'm up there saying Mass, and I take the pall off, and I look down, and there's a cookie, everything's going to break to a halt. Because if a priest could pick that cookie up and pronounce the words of institution over it, nothing's going to happen to that cookie at all. But something's going to happen to him. It's going to be an unbelievable sacrilege. Because he's, you, he's, there's not proper matter to confect a sacrament. And he's sat there and pronounced the words without the proper matter. It's like that. It's like if someone won't confess their sins, it's like trying to consecrate cookies. There's nothing going to happen except to the priest. And who gave that advice? To his confessors. To his missionaries of mercy. A few weeks back... On the flight back from Mexico, he said in his somewhat confusing way, the contraception could be an option in serious matters. His spokesman then clarified, what did the Pope really mean? I'll read from LifeSite News. Rome, February 19, 2016. Vatican spokesman Father Federico Lombardi has affirmed that the Holy Father was indeed speaking of condoms and contraceptives when on the flight back from Mexico, Pope Francis said couples could rightly avoid pregnancy in the wake of the Zika virus scare. Father Lombardi told Vatican Radio today the contraceptive or condom in particular cases of emergency or gravity could be the object of discernment in a serious case of conscience. This is what the Pope said. According to Lombardi, the Pope spoke of the possibility of taking recourse to contraception or condoms in case of emergency or special situations. He is not saying this possibility is accepted without discernment. Indeed, he said clearly it can be considered in cases of special urgency. Well, you actually don't need the church to teach this because this is the natural law. Contraception is against the natural law. The actual infallible teaching of the church can be found, among other places, in the 1968 encyclical Humana Vitae, which Paul VI reiterated that artificial contraception is intrinsically wrong. And there aren't many things that are intrinsically wrong, but this is one of them. Namely, it is always and everywhere, in every instance, evil because it contradicts the procreative purpose of sex. Under no circumstances whatsoever are contraceptives or condoms permitted. None. Zippo. Nada. Ever. It is motu propria on annulments for the Latin Church. Pope Francis has given various grounds for annulments which are no such thing. For example... One of the grounds, these are the 45-day hit the eject button annulment. It's unbelievable. But it started on December 8th. One of them is the marriage broke up quickly. Let me just pause for a brief moment just to give an annulment is a decision by ecclesiastical court, it's called a tribunal, that at the moment of consent, they didn't validly enter into the contract. Because marriage is a contract that results in a relationship, or maybe a better way to think of it, it's a relationship resulting from a contract. A man and a woman make the contract. God makes a relationship. If the contract is validly made, no power can break it. Not possible. We just have to support those people and help them get to heaven even though everything broke up. The fact that their marriage broke up quickly has zippo to do with whether or not the contract was validly made. You can make the contract invalidly. If people show up drunk and you're stupid enough to sit there and, and, and witness the marriage, you've put things in real, real predicament. If people, you know, shotgun marriage, yeah. Uh, something where she's 13, that's not old enough uh, to give consent. There's different ways where, you know, or he's a railroader and he's got a wife in, in, already in Salt Lake. It's not going to work here in, 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 in Rapid City. There's ways where it actually, but for the most part, are you kidding me? What is breaking up quick? There's, there, uh, there, he put about 14 in there. Out of them, if I remember right, there's, there's over 10 that aren't grounds at all. It's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling. In her tr- letter, Sister Lucia seems to be announcing the troubles, the heresy, and finally the great apostasy, which will arise in the church during last times. Here are a few excerpts from letters written after 1960 by Sister Lucia. Unfortunately, in religious matters, the people for the most part are ignorant and allow themselves to be led wherever they are taken. Hence the great responsibility of the one who has the duty of leading them. I am now in the position as a priest in union with the Pope 
that's faithful to the church, that if people come up, to, come up to me and, for example, want to get an annulment for a case, I say, well, yes, that's, I, I, can't, I can't support you in that. And they say, well, the Pope will. And I'll have to say, you're correct, the Pope will. The tribunals will, but I have a soul to save. I actually have to be in opposition to the Pope. If somebody comes up to me and asks me about contraception in serious matters, I have to say, no, the Pope is wrong. This is a strange, but it's unique. We haven't been here before. This is a first. We haven't been here before. And I know the church history. Sister Lucia, there is a diabolical disorientation invading the world and misleading souls. The devil has succeeded in infiltrating evil under the cover of good, and the blind are beginning to guide others. And the worst is that he succeeded in leading into error and deceiving souls, having a heaven responsibility through the place which they occupy. They're blind men, leading other blind men. The Filipino bishops signed off on Francis's uh, claims on contraception. They're not going to be the last ones. I'll be surprised if every bishop conference doesn't do it. Maybe Kazakhstan will stand their ground. Some of them, perhaps Poland. They're blind men leading blind men. They let themselves be dominated by the diabolical wave invading the world. Let people say the rosary every day. Our Lady has repeated that in all of her apparitions, as if to fortify us in these times of diabolical disorientation, in order that we not let ourselves be deceived by false doctrines. Close quotes, Sister Lucia. All of this is consonant with that solemn warning that Our Lady of Akita gave to Sister Agnes on October 13, 1973, the very anniversary of the miracle of the sun at Fatima. The work of the devil will infiltrate the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against other bishops. The priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their confreres. Churches and altars sacked. The church will be full of those who accept compromise, and the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. The demon will be especially implacable against souls consecrated to God. The thought of the loss of so many souls is the cause of my sadness. If sins increase in number and gravity, there will no longer be pardon for them. Pray very much the prayers of the rosary. I alone am still able to save you from the calamities which approach. Those who place their confidence in me will be saved. There's a fascinating passage in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which speaks of the apostasy in a way that we should all ponder very carefully. The Catechism. Before Christ's second coming, the Church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. Close quote, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers in the form of a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. We continue. Other signs of the apostasy will be the moral climate. In Luke 17, 26 to 30, our Lord specifically states that the conditions of the world at the time of his second coming would mirror both the days of Noah and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. The condition of the world at the time of the coming, second coming will mirror both the days of Noah and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, the days of Sodom and Gomorrah need no explanation. What's the state of things in the days of Noah? We can get a little bit of insight as to what those days were like by consulting the ancient Jewish com- commentaries known as the Midrash. In two places, those ancient commentaries state that, quote, the generation of the flood was not wiped out until they wrote marriage documents for the union of a man to a male or to an animal. Close quote. 
The generation of the flood was not wiped out until they wrote marriage documents for the union of a man to a male or to an animal. In other words, these days are like the days of Noah and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. And as we already noted, the miracle of the sun itself recalls both the days of Noah and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Insofar as the rain fall by the sun shooting out the colors of the rainbow are reminiscent of the judgment of mankind by means of the great flood and the rainbow there. And the sun falling from the sky is reminiscent of the fire falling from the sky on Sodom and Gomorrah. And besides that, it's also reminiscent of that fire that both scripture and tradition state will fall from the sky at the end of the world. In Italy, just a few weeks past, we had these uh, homosexual so-called marriages be passed, be decriminalized. I don't know what you want to call it. The Holy Father, in an interview on the plane, was asked about this. He's the primate of Italy and the Bishop of Rome, and he said he doesn't involve himself in political problems. And in the same uh, exact interview where he proclaimed he doesn't involve himself in political issues, where that's actually a very important one, he instantly involved himself in political issues because he started talking about the border wall, that, that, that it would, no Christian could be for building a wall on the border, you know, of, of, I, I guess it's, it's Trump or somebody. I mean, I don't even care about this stuff. But he said you couldn't be a Christian to do that. You know who's the only ruler of a wa- completely walled-in country in the world? There's only one country that's completely walled in to keep people out. It's called the Vatican. Huge walls. He's the ruler of the only walled-in country in the world. I wonder if his predecessors were Christians that built that. He doesn't involve himself in political problems except when he does, which is almost all the time. But he doesn't involve himself in stuff that has to do with homosexuals. And that thing passed. And I think there was about one Italian bishop involved. You had rallies of Italians, and that's not something they regularly do, that came down there. Unbelievable giant rallies for the family. Crickets from the Vatican. That, that woman that calls herself Diego and had all these mutilating operations and all that, to, so she... You know, she, she needs uh, two things. She needs an exorcism, and she needs to, mental health help. Uh, she calls herself Diego, had all these mutilating operations, and takes the hormones and all that, so she thinks she's a man. And then she has a, 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 you know, a female partner. And so the Spanish priest was doing the right thing, of course, and telling her, this is an abuse, this is an abomination, you can't do that. So who calls her up, invites her, and has an audience? And you can see the pictures he's got taken with her. And you can watch the film when he was in D.C. at the embassy meeting with the homosexual male couple. It's serious. The church must pass through a final trial that will sake the faith of many believers in the form of a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of an apostasy from the truth. Now, last night we heard about Mother Mariana, who was chosen by Our Lady to be a victim soul for our times for the 20th century. This is a woman that lived in late 1500s and early 1600s. One of the most important apparitions, and remember these are approved, of Our Lady Good Success to Mother Mariana occurred on February 2nd, 1634, the Feast of the Purification. As Mother Mariana prayed before the Blessed Sacrament, she saw the sanctuary light extinguish itself, leaving the altar place completely dark. Our Lady then explained to her a number of meanings of the tabernacle light that had been extinguished before her eyes. And she's speaking of the 20th century. One of the reasons the lamp was extinguished is because, quote, of the spirit of impurity that will saturate the atmosphere in those times. Like a filthy ocean, it will inundate the streets, squares, and public places with an astonishing liberty. There will be almost no virgin souls in the world. Without virginity, it would be necessary for the fire of heaven to fall upon these lands to purify them. During those unfortunate times, evil will assault childhood innocence. The secular clergy will be far removed from its ideal because the priests will be careless in their sacred duties. Losing the divine compass, they will stray from the road traced by God for the priestly ministry. 
And it's also due to the indifference of the people in allowing the name of God to be gradually extinguished and adhering to the spirit of evil, freely delivering themselves to the vices and passions. So you can see these prophetic indications right here of the moral atmosphere in our times, which is also consonant with all the predictions of the moral atmosphere in the end times. That by way of background, and I want to walk slowly through then, I'll read it first, the vision, and we'll walk slowly through it and make just comments on it. Third part of the secret revealed at the Kova de Iria Fatima on 13 July 1917. I write in obedience to my God, who command me to do so through His Excellency, the Bishop of Liera, and to your Most Holy Mother and mine. After the two parts which I have already explained, at the left of Our Lady and a little bud above, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand. Flashing, it gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire. But they died out in contact with the splendor that Our Lady radiated towards him from her right hand. Pointing to the earth with his right hand, the angel cried out in a loud voice, Penance! Penance, penance. And we saw in an immense light that is God something similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it. A bishop dressed in white. We had the impression that it was the Holy Father. Other bishops, priests, men and women religious going up a steep mountain, at the top of which there was a big cross of rough-hewn trunks, as of a cork tree with the bark. Before reaching there, the Holy Father passed through a big city half in ruins and half trembling, with halting step, Afflicted with pain and sorrow, he prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on his way. Having reached the top of the mountain, on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him. And in the same way there died one after another, the various bishops, priests, men and women religious, and various lay peoples of different ranks and positions. Beneath the two arms of the cross there were two angels each with a crystal aspersorium in his hand, in which they gathered up the blood of the martyrs, and with his sprinkle of souls, they were making their way to God. 2-3-1, 1994. Close quote. So, that's the vision. Probable explanation going on here. And it's just probable. But based on everything we've gone through, And also based on the fact that Sister Lucia said it was conditional. As you remember, and if not, I can grab that quote fairly quickly here. But she said it was conditional. It, the conditions were that, uh, that people would respond to the very things that she, uh, she requested, Our Lady requested. And then Sister Lucia said, but they haven't. And since they haven't, she said, we can see that we're going bit by bit walking towards this, this finality without, uh, by little, little by little by great steps, is what she said. So, in 1982, she wrote that letter to the Pope. It's conditioned. And the condition is penance. The conditions were to do penance, to pray, to do the five first Saturdays in reparation, and to consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart. And in 82, as she said, it hadn't been done. And it still hasn't. We went through that yesterday. So at a certain point in time, one goes from conditions to realities that are not going to be pleasant. In August, we know that, as we said yesterday, but we'll talk about this. In August of 1931, our Lord spoke to Sister Lucia and said, Make it known to my ministers, given that they follow the example of the King of France in delaying the execution of my command. Let's just stop there. What was the command? St. Margaret Mary. June 17th, 1689, our Lord commanded the King of France through St. Margaret Mary to consecrate France to his sacred heart. Put his sacred heart on the flag. There were a number of other things. But to consecrate, he had the five first Fridays, or the nine first Fridays. So the consecration of the Sacred Heart, the nine First Fridays, and reparation for the blasphemies against the Sacred Heart, and so forth. This is a parallel situation. So to go back to that, make it known to my ministers, given that they follow the example of the King of France and delaying the execution of my command, like him, they will follow him into misfortune. It will never be too late to have recourse to Jesus and Mary. All right, this is frightening. On June 17, 1689, our Lord had commanded the King of France 
through St. Margaret Mary Alcoque to consecrate France to his sacred heart. The king did nothing about it. In fact, for a full 100 years, the kings did nothing about it. On June 17, 1789, and that's exactly 100 years from the day our Lord had asked for the consecration of France to his sacred heart, the third estate began the French Revolution by declaring itself a national assembly. Four years later, the king was publicly guillotined, and as everyone knows, the French Revolution was an absolute bloodbath. And our Lord says, Given my ministers to follow the example of the king of France, in delaying the execution of my command, like him they have fallen into misfortune. So, insofar as they don't correspond, it's, con- it's one of those contingent kind of prophecies. This doesn't have to happen. Now it is going to happen because people didn't correspond. Things are set on the way. As, as Benedict XVI said, and his, he made a pilgrimage to Fatima in, uh, in May. He went there May 13, 2010. One of the lines that really strikes it in me, he talks about the sufferings of the church are not, but the line that strikes me, he says, man has the power to unleash a cycle of death and terror, but he's not able to stop it. It's very similar to something that St. John Paul II said in, in, in 1980 when he was asked about the secret as well. We're on kind of a, a collision course because we haven't as a people, and you don't need the priest to point out that we're, you know, that we're living like, a, generally speaking, heathens, Almost everywhere. Maybe not present company, but it's, it's pretty obvious what we're like. It's, it's spectacularly bad, huh? And Sister Lucia pointed that out too. Let it not be said that, that God is causing this. It's men not corresponding. Huh? Okay, so the contingency. The penance, penance, penance. So you see Our Lady, and she's holding her right hand. He's got the angel above her, but she's holding her right hand, and she's keeping the flame from striking. We'll come back to that. That's then. That's a contingent kind of thing. She can move her hand. Then the flame strikes. Okay, we'll come back to that. We saw an immense light that has got something similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it. And this is in quotes. It's very, it's, it's, this part's very curious. A bishop dressed in white. We had the impression it was the Holy Father. My opinion is this is the Pope. After all, hell breaks loose because it goes a, a little bit farther here. Um, he because he, he, he passed the big city half in ruins. I think this is my opinion. It's the Pope Francis coming to you know like after all everything the court gets pulled out and everything goes crazy. Basically coming to his senses at that point in time because he's a bishop in white. They, they have the pressure. He's the Holy Father. He doesn't take the red. It has implications for Benedict too that are curious. I'm not really sure about that. But, uh, and the way they, they phrased this, but, but that he sees what happened, because it says right here, before reaching there, he, there's the big cross, but we'll just skip down to the other part of the Holy Father. The Holy Father passed through a big city, half in ruins and half, half trembling with halting step, afflicted with pain and sorrow. He prayed for the souls of the corpse he met on his way. And so the, the, the ruined city. The city is interesting. You have different things that it can stand for. I think in the first instance, it stands for the city of Rome. But the city of Rome is to the church and the world what Jerusalem and the Old Covenant was to the church and the world. In the Old Covenant, Jerusalem and the temple was considered a microcosm of the world. And, and so everything, that, that's the holy city then. But then God, and so that Jerusalem, you have the temple built on the rock. That's where the Dome of the Rock is now. But the rock, that's where, the, in, the, in the Holy of Holies, that's where the Ark of the Covenant sat on top of that in the holy place. That rock is the one that Abraham was tied up, or tied up Isaac and laid him on to sacrifice. And later on, David bought it because it was used as a threshing floor. Before he had combines, they used to thrash out grain on hilltops and he tossed toss the grain in there and the chaff would blow away. It's on a hilltop because he get some good wind. And that's how you'd work it. It was a lot more complicated with combines and all. But then David bought it and Solomon built the temple right there. That is what the Dome of the Rock is on. And the ancient uh, Jewish, it's kind of mythology, but they thought that rock was important in, in, in holding back the abyss. It was like a plug from the abyss to keep all hell from breaking loose and flow it onto the earth. So the, the Jewish guys knew this kind of thing. So when our Lord said to Peter, you're a rock, he changed his name to rock. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. He took his, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against him. So he took that rock and he moved him from Jerusalem into Rome and built his church on that. 
but and he's got a, a, an op, an a, office and holding back all hell from breaking loose himself. So you go from the old covenant to the new covenant. So Jerusalem was a type of the whole world. Now the city of Rome is a type of the world. So in the first place, it stands for for itself. It's Rome. But in the second place, it's going to stand for the church and the world. So and he's going through. It's half in ruins and half trembling with halting step. Why would it be half in ruins? We talked about that last night. The goal was explicitly set by Muhammad himself of capturing Rome. I think they've tried seven times so far. That's why the Vatican City is walled, by the way, because of Muslims. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the, the Vatican, the, the, uh, the Islam has an explicit goal of conquering Rome. I read a bunch of testimonies from the last ten years from important thinkers in the Islamic world and uh, ta- all talking explicitly that the time is ripe that we're going to capture Rome. And a lot of what you have going on right now is actually jihadists moving into Europe. That's what a lot of this flow is in there. And we read from an e-book that was published last year for the jihadists. And in the e-book, it's recommending, it talks about the fight for Rome. And it's going to be guerrilla warfare in the streets. And what they need to do is they need to stockpile weapons that aren't illegal, so they'll be convenient to get. And it specifically recommends homemade bows and arrows, which is interesting when we get a little later here because we see... The Pope, having reached the top of the mountain on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him. It seems probably that this is it. We'd also have those visions, the two visions that Blessed Jacinta had of the Pope that we read last night. But you remember, at one point in time, he's sitting there, he's just trembling, there's all this chaos and people yelling and all that. Another one, he's praying in the church, all these people crying in the streets, they're starving and all that, and he's praying before the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So this is on his way through there. So it, it'd be uh, Roman ruins, but uh, certainly it, it's, it's larger than that. If it's Islam, I don't know, but uh, they, they've got the goal and they've got the momentum right now, and there's certainly tons of them in Europe. What's the reason for Europe being in Europe? It's Catholicism. And if we've rejected it, why should it be preserved? If we're not going to act like Catholics, why should it be preserved? That's the only meaning of the Europe. There's a vocation. The European vocation is to be missionaries to the world, and we're still doing it. But now our missionaries of Marxism, feminism, pornography, go down the list. Almost all the bad things are propelled out into the world. Because that missionary spirit is part of the gift. God gave different gifts to give different peoples. And that was the gift, one of the gifts. It's a charism that he gave. And it's being used. But since the French Revolution, certainly it's been used aggressively on the side of evil. Okay, so we go back. So he, there, you have bishops, priests, men, and religious going up a steep mountain at the top of which there's a big cross of rough hewn trunks, and then uh, they get they get martyred. So you have all this martyrdom going on in what of this attack? I, I, do, I wouldn't claim that it's all Islam. I don't want to say that. Uh, I, I still suspect very deeply that Russia has an important role to play in this till the consecration, and the way that uh, certainly the West has been. Uh, Provocative, provocative and poking around and all that, it wouldn't surprise me at all if they're not going to be the bigger force in the whole thing. But uh, that remains to be seen. What about, the pen, what about this penance, penance, penance? Let's go back to this. We saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand flashing, he gave up flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire. But they died out in contact with the splendor that our lady, lady radiated towards him from her right hand. Pointing to the earth was his right hand. The angel cried out in a loud voice, penance, Penance, penance. Okay. What's going on there? She's stopping this judgment from falling. We heard about that same kind of judgment elsewhere in Akita. Again, that was October 13, 1973. Bishop Ito of the Diocese of Akita, Japan, found this apparition to be authentic and worthy of belief. And well in Rome, spoke to Cardinal Ratzinger about the apparition. Howard D., former Philippine ambassador to the Vatican, states in a 1998 interview with Inside the Vatican ma- magazine, quote, Bishop Ida was certain Akita was an extension of Fatima, and Ricardo Ratzinger personally confirmed to me that these two messages of Fatima and Akita are essentially the same, close quote. So here is the first part of that. 
Our Lady speaking to Sister Agnes. As I told you, if men do not repent and better themselves, penance, penance, penance. If they don't, here's the contingent part. Then, if they don't, here's what's going to happen. The Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge, such as one will have never seen before. Fire will fall from the sky and wipe out a great part of humanity, the good as well as the bad, sparing neither priests nor faithful. The survivors will find themselves so desolate that they will envy the dead. The only arms that will remain for you will be the rosary and the sign left me by my son. Each day recite the prayers of the rosary. With the rosary, pray for the pope, the bishops, and the priests. So there we have that right there, very clearly in that. There's also something that Sister Lucia, let me find the piece of paper that I, I read from last night. It'll just take me a sec. Because Lucia, this has only been published in 2013 by the, the nuns in her convent. And it's, it's, it's something very, very new in that sense. And uh, it's from her, her journals, uh, just right here. Well, I'll read John Paul II first, and then we'll get that. So it's the October 1981 issue of the German magazine Stimmenet des Glaubens, reported on a discussion that Pope John Paul II had with a select group of German Catholics in November of 1980. The following is a verbatim report of the discussion. Quote, The Holy Father was asked, What about the third secret of Fatima? Should it not already have been published by 1960? Pope John Paul II replied, Given the seriousness of the contents, my predecessors in the Petron office diplomatically preferred to postpone publication so as not to encourage the world power of communism to make certain moves. On the other hand, it should be sufficient for all Christians to know this. If there is a message in which it is written that the oceans will flood whole areas of the earth, and from one moment to the next, millions of people will perish. Truly, the publication of such a message is no longer something to be so much desired. The Pope continued, Many wish to know simply from curiosity a taste for the sensational, but they forget that knowledge also implies responsibility. They seek only the satisfaction of their own curiosity, and that is dangerous if at the same time they are not disposed to do something, and if they are convinced that it is impossible to do anything, against evil. Okay, so that's the Pope. He's not talking about fire from the sky. He's talking about oceans flooding whole areas of the earth. Now, I'll just find one other thing from Sister Lucia, if I can, real quickly, because I pulled it out cleverly before the thing and then put it in a pile when we were talking. Here we go. 4 p.m., January 3, 1944, in the chapel of a convent, before the tabernacle, Sister Lucia asked Jesus to make known his will. She's been struggling for a couple months to write the third secret. Quote, I then felt a friendly hand, maternal and affectionate, touch my shoulder. Our Lady said to her, Be at peace and write what I have commanded you, but not, however, that which has been given to you to understand its meaning. Immediately afterwards, sister, said Sister Lucia, quote, I felt my spirit inundated by a mystery of light that is God, and in him I saw and heard the point of a lance like a flame that is detached, touches the axis of the earth, and it trembles. Mountains, cities, towns, and villages with their inhabitants are buried. The sea, the rivers, the clouds exceed their boundaries, inundating and dragging with them in a vortex, houses and people in a number that cannot be counted. It is the purification of the world from the sin in which it is immersed. Hatred and ambition provoke the destructive war. After I felt my racing heart, in my spirit a soft voice said, In time, one faith one baptism, one church, holy, catholic, apostolic, in eternity, heaven. This word heaven filled my heart with peace and happiness in such a way that almost without being aware of it, I kept repeating myself for a long time, heaven, heaven, close quote. From this, she got the strength to write the third secret. So we can see the beginning part, the conditional, if, if men would repent, if what Our Lady said would be done, then this wasn't going to happen. We haven't. What about all this stuff I talked a little bit earlier about these, these curious things? We're talking about the apostasy and the role of the Pope playing in it. And why would that be important? Where would that be in the secret? It's not directly in the vision. But what is interesting is speaking in Fatima... 
about Fatima, St. John Paul II, when they, when they uh, it, unveiled the vision and published it to the world, in his sermon, he expanded on the things that Paul VI had said in 67, and things he himself said. And one of the specific things he commented on was the Apocalypse, chapter 12. And one of the lines he warned us about is in Apocalypse 12, 4. And in 12, 4, we're talking about the, with, the, with his tail, the, dra- the, da- dra- the dragon, because there's this dragon that's coming to attack the woman, because 12, 1 is about the woman in, in the heavens. By the, by the heavens, it does, you have to realize in the old, old way of looking at things, there's three heavens. The first heaven is what we call the atmosphere. The second heaven is what we call outer space. And the third heaven is what we call heaven. They have different names. It doesn't matter. But that's, and in this one, it's talking about the atmosphere. That's 12.1. The ancient commentaries say that. That's exactly where she appeared, on Homo. And then you'd see her, they'd, they'd see that ball of light uh, going away or whatever. Okay. So Our Lady, this, clothed with the sun, a sign in the heavens, Our Lady clothed with the sun, and then the dragon comes after. But in 12, uh, four, he takes with his tail, he, he, he uh, wipes a, a, a third of the stars uh, and, and throws them to earth. I will just do a flying translation very quickly. Kind of, it'll be a combination of a translation with an explanation from the commentary of Cornelius Lapide. This commentary was done in the early 1600s. And Cornelius Lapide did it, he was a Jesuit, he did it at the order of the popes. And so it's a line by line commentary in the scriptures according to the fathers. So I'm reading you something that's, that, that was put together 400 years ago, but it's more ancient, the, the commentaries on that. But he talks about, on, on, and with, his, with his tail he drove, dragged down a third part of the stars. Truly I say along with St. Gregory the Great, Ribeir and others, that just as the, 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 the principal part of the dragon is his head, so also this tail represents the Antichrist. For he is both the head of the dragon, because he shall be the primary, the, the, he'll be the primary uh, uh, leader of, uh, led by the devil, and the prince of all the tyrants and the impious ones. But the same must be said about his tail, because that's the extremity of the dragon. That is the bodily, the body of the devil, like sort of like we say the mystical body of Christ. It's like the mystical body of the devil in this sense. And, uh, and, and with this, he will, he will drag behind himself into perfidy a, a third part of the stars. That is, most illustrious saints. In, in other words, as if the leaders, the teachers, and other eminent men, insofar as they are stars shining to others. For when he drags them along with him, he will pervert a great multitude. So in other words, when they're talking about the, the dragon, when they're talking about the dragon tail, dragging a third of the stars from heaven, he's talking about the great leaders and sweeping them along. Other commentaries say this is especially to be understood of the clergy. So, why would it not be published? Directly. Well, as, as Cardinal Ratzinger made clear in the interviews where he spoke about it, we don't want to have sensationalist uh, use of the contents and so forth. If, 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 it were, if it were to be said that the great apostasy is going to start at the top in the church, that Rome will, I mean, what would have people thought if they said, soon you're going to have to not be able to depend when the Pope speaks on matters of faith and morals, you're going to have to look in your catechism every time. How do people react to that? That's where we're at right now. I just used a few examples. There's hundreds of them. Hundreds. How do people react? Right now, this is hard to talk about. It's probably hard to hear. The sensation of people will also be tempted to give up. There's going to be a chastisement if we don't better ourselves. How to react? The situation in the church is unparalleled in history. I'm very much of the opinion it's going to accelerate. Instead of the bishops and cardinals rising up and rebuking the Pope for teaching error and defending Christ in his mystical body, so far we've seen two things, guilty silence and positive evil. 
There's no reason to think the Filipino bishops will be alone in aligning themselves with things like contraception is going to be okay. When's the last time we've heard a bishop conference that speak out against contraception? Canada, since 1968, their, their official position, the Winnipeg Declaration, they officially dissent from Humana Vitae. They've been unofficial. That's their bishop's position since 68. The last time our bishops made a, a comment that, that was really good on contraception was 1966, November. Is that a problem? Just use that one. This is not the worst thing that ever happened. But I know a parish I used to be in charge of, we had just over 800 people. More than half of them were under the age of 18. That's about right. But when you go to other parishes, it's like, is the water different here? Now, I don't know any particular couple. I can't say, you know, God's the judge of that. I don't know, you know, but there should be a bell-shaped curve. And at the age that people get married in America, which is fairly late, your mean should be somewhere between seven and nine kids. That's not what we're seeing. The mean's around 2.5 in a lot of Catholic parishes. You go in there and say, what is going on? Don't tell me about vocation crisis. It is a, it's, it's gigantic. And who is supposed to tell them? We are. Crickets. Do we believe in hell? The first secret really matters. So, the situation is unparalleled. I think it's going to get worse. Father Alonso, the official archivist of Fatima, had unrestricted his sister Lucia and her writings comments. It is probable that the text refers concretely to the crisis of faith in the church and the negligences of the pastors themselves. The third speaker speaks of internal struggles in the wombs of the church, of grave pastoral negligences by the upper hierarchy and deficiencies of the upper hierarchy of the church. Close quotes. So we don't see that in the vision. These are things we have to infer. But we've gone through how we've inferred that. The church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers, the catechism tells us, in the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. Okay, what do we do? First, we need to take it seriously. Say your rosary every day. Say your rosary every day and stay very, very close to Our Lady. Say your rosary. I'll give you a couple of scriptural images to have in mind. The first one. Almost the very first papal act was what? It was denying our Lord three times and running away. And what did almost every one of the other bishops do? They ran away too. Who's the only one that stayed faithful? St. John. St. John stayed faithful. And why did St. John stay faithful? Because St. John stayed next to her. When he was watching our Lord bleed out on the cross, what a mystery that was. We know the end of the story. But here he is. He's been walking with him. He knows he's the Messiah, the Son of God. And all of a sudden, he's seized by these people and beat so savagely, it's unbelievable. And then he's being murdered on that cross. He's saying, well, how can God die? How can this happen? You can see, he couldn't answer the question. He knew if I stayed close to Our Lady, he'll be all right. We're in the passion of the church. The scandal and the sin is so galactic that you'd need an angelic intellect to take it in. We don't have to take it in. Stay close to Our Lady. Be humble and stay close to Our Lady. We'll be all right. One more scriptural image, and then I'll go back to some other advice. Whilst our Lord was walking around visibly present on earth... There are a bunch of gangsters running his church. Caiaphas, Annas, the Sanhedrin. I mean, these are the people that conspired and killed him. They weren't all bad. Nicodemus was one of the members of Sanhedrin, but they knew who he was. Nicodemus comes in the very beginning of our Lord's ministry. John 3. And he comes to him at night, and he says, We know you're a teacher sent by God, because no one could do the things you do. This is the beginning. So leaders knew from the beginning what our Lord was about. But they still conspired against him. And our Lord knew they were conspired against him. And so the people say, what do we do? Look at these people. What did our Lord say? He said, they sit on the chair of Moses. In other words, they have the authority. 
So you have to do what they say, but not what they do. That means we have to follow all the legitimate commands. We can't follow this kind of teaching, but we have to follow all the legitimate commands. Because it's Christ's church, even through the sin and chaos. Okay? So say a rosary every day. Second, make sure, absolutely sure, that you're positively dedicated to the truth. That you're ready and willing to die for the truth. And if you're not positive about that, start praying for that grace every day. Because you're going to need it. Pray for that grace. Pray for that grace. Quit lying to yourself if you don't have that. Make yourself believe things because they're convenient or they fit your little worldview. Just embrace the truth and pray for that grace. No matter how much it hurts, pray for the grace to embrace the truth. Third, occupy yourself with your duties in your state and life. That's exactly what she said was needed to be saved. Occupy yourself with your duties in your state and life. Don't worry so much about what they're doing in the Chancery or in the Vatican. In fact, my giant advice to you is don't worry about it at all. If something's important has happened, you'll hear about it. But if you occupy yourself with these kind of things, I feel bad telling you what I told you, but we have to put things in context. Don't preoccupy yourself. If you hear something like that, say, oh, I guess I better say another decade today for the Pope or the Cardinal or whoever it might be and put it out of your mind. You don't have to answer for it, but you do have to pray for him. Don't occupy yourself with these things. Pray for them. Don't occupy yourself with it. Okay. But uh, everyone here has access to good catechism, good lives of the saints, good scripture commentary. This is a real religion. It's a revealed religion. Public revelation ended with the death of St. John the Apostle. Not even the Pope can change that. Nothing is going to change regarding the truth. What has changed is the Holy See no longer tells the truth. That's changed. And that's a huge change. So, don't pay attention. Pay attention. It's all written down. You don't have to worry. Pay attention to what's already been written down. There's nothing new. If you hear something new, you think, can't be. There's nothing new. There will be nothing new. Don't let yourself get dragged out on that. So you're going to be safe if you don't pay attention. I'm not, if they give legitimate commands, that. But I mean, don't pay attention to this kind of stuff because it's just going to induce chaos and confusion into your life. You don't need that. Renew your devotion to Our Lady. If you haven't made the, the total consecration to Our Lady, the t- true devotion of St. Louis de Montfort, it's a 33-day consecration, then by all means you should do this. It's recommended by so many saints and popes. It'll change your life. The True Devotion to Mary by St. Louis de Montfort. You can get the book, read the book. It takes 33 days then, and you do it on a Marian feast day. It's a fantastic thing. Maybe Father will even have, have one where every, the parish does it together. They do that sometimes in parishes. But I just can't recommend that enough. True Devotion to Mary. Say your rosary every day. Stay close to the sacraments. Go to confession regularly very regularly, and then communion. If we're not saints after our first Holy Communion, it isn't because there's some defect in the sacrament. One communion is sufficient to make us a great saint. It's because our disposition is not such that our Lord wants to give us graces, but he can't get them to us. And what confession does is it opens our spiritually blocked arteries so more graces can get in there. So do that. Final thing I'll say tonight is pick up the habit of mental prayer. It's very easy. Even children can do it. I have people, some of my directors start their little children just kneel in front of a statue and talk to somebody for just a, a few seconds or whatever when they're real little, and they can just add to that. But the way we can do it, there's a good book, Conversation with Christ by, by Thomas Rohrbach. It's a tan book. The Method of St. Teresa of Avila, Mental Prayer. There's plenty of other ones. Father could easily recommend them. But you take that, read that, and then start doing it 15 minutes every day. Make an investment in your eternity. Do it 15 minutes every day, and then every three months, add five minutes till you get to an hour. Do it humbly and slowly, and that'll seem huge. The 15 minutes is hard. If 15 minutes is too much, do 10 minutes. But do it every day. Make yourself do it. Don't worry, like, how you feel about it. It's, you're, at, you're giving time to God. This is your 15 minutes, God. I'm going to come there and do my best. 
if you, you're randomly thinking thoughts, that's not bad. If you're sitting there and you're also trying to do your shopping list at the same time, that's not going to work. But if you just spend that 15 minutes, you can do it in your room. Pick a place, though. If you're at church, that's great. But pick a place and do it the same place because that's just useful. A particular chair, a particular corner, a closet, whatever. And you just do it every day, 15 minutes, and add that five minutes. It's going to transform you. And I don't care how busy you are. God's in charge of time. You can keep adding that time humbly and slowly, and you'll be able to get there and get more done than before. And the beauty of this is you are going to get lights that you wouldn't get otherwise, and we're going to need everything we can take to get through what we've got coming up. Okay? Say your rosary. Consecrate yourself to Our Lady. Don't pay much attention. All legitimate commands we have to listen, but other than that, the chaos and the hierarchy... Just pray for him. Just pray for him. We have to obey, but pray. Just don't do that. Pray for the grace to be willing to die for the truth. Read good catechisms, good lives of the saints, good scriptural commentaries, and stay close to Our Lady. I'll give you all a blessing, and then he'll will do the consecration. If you'll kneel down. Pax Alexiotentis. Amen.